here to the Brunel Research Festival, our second last day. Uh, I'm Meredith Jones. I'm director of the Institute of Communities and Society here at Brunel. And this institute, along with Christina Victor's institute, uh, ran Brunel's very first Brill earlier this year. Brill stands for Brunel Research Interdisciplinary Lab. And these are a series of labs that we're running to bring researchers from all across Brunel together to work on innovative interdisciplinary projects. They're very much blue sky projects uh, that we have a broad theme for each Brill. And the theme for this Brill, which was the first one, was 21st century bodies. And you'll be able to see from the presentations here this morning that this covered a vast array of topics. People come, came up with an incredible uh, amount and incredible amount of imagination and innovation around the topics. Um, we are, they're now several months into uh, their projects. They've all been internally funded and we hope that they all will be externally funded as well as you know within a year or so the order uh, and general timetable for today we're going to hear first from william watkin and adrian Mil milner speaking for about 15 minutes then we're having uh annie chan and her team talking about avatars then we're having ronan McCarth mccarthy and his team talking about extinction, then Emily Hunt and her team talking about body image, and then Harjit Singh and his team talking about true value of a unit of energy. After each of the 15-minute presentations, there'll be time just for a couple of clarifying questions. Please don't ask long questions there. Please don't tell us about your grandmother's topiary. We just want clarifying questions. Then at the end, we'll have a discussion, uh, which can be between participants, between uh, pre presenters, uh, and of course, uh, from members of the audience. So please feel free to either ask questions in the chat. You can, of course, you can all answer questions in the chat as well, um, or ask questions uh, directly by putting your hand up. Um, and I'm usually pretty good at noticing when hands are up, but if uh, I happen to ignore you for some reason, it's not because I don't like you, it's just that I've missed your hand for some reason. So please then just uh, do, an, do a, a digital yell out to me. Okay, so welcome everybody and let's move straight into our first presentation. And I believe it's going to be from William about teaching AI to read and block racism online. William, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, Adrian is a really valuable member of the team, isn't here today. She's visiting her family in the States after not having seen them for several years because of COVID. So I'm going to do the presentation. Um, and before I go into the slides, this presentation um, talks about a project that was repurposed, um, speaking to an idea I often think about in terms of um, the renewable nature or the sustainable nature of research initiatives. So this was an abject failure when we put this project together for the UKRI rapid response bid in the during the first lockdown. And that was myself and Professor Jago Morrison working on a, a method that had been in my mind for a while. And we, we tried to make this um, <clears throat> a rapid response data analytics run method using arts and humanities, but we were uh, disastrously turned down. Um, we were very depressed and then we put stuff together and then Brill came along and I'd realised that one of the key issues was we didn't have the right team. And so I was quite um, active during Brill in putting together this uh, remarkable team. So that's now we're going to, we've written our bid and we're about to go through internal approval on the bid, uh, hopefully then to apply for the Leverhulme outline um, in a few months. So that's where we are. So it's really moved forward and that's all thanks to Brill. Uh, let me share the slides. Okay. 
Can everyone see those? I'm not not very good at sharing on Teams. Yes, no? Yep. Yeah, cool. OK, so the project's called Teaching AI to Read Racism. It's a Levy Hume bid submission. As I said, it's um, pretty far advanced. We've put together our um, outline bid and it's going through internal. It's about to go through internal approval. OK, so we started with a problem, which is that racist online behaviour is, as we all know, a significant cause of conflict and distress in our society. It's particularly relevant with Elon Musk buying or not buying Twitter and the new government wide paper on uh, social media and uh, data analytics and so on. So we thought that it was a really uh, timely problem to address. Um, we focused on racist language usage because we felt that the the, that was the expertise in the team, and that was also something that was quite focused. We realised that contemporary racist language usage is complex, more complex, we believe, than people perhaps appreciate when they're doing data analytics. So one of the things we learned from Adrian in particular, I think, was many perpetrators of racism online are unaware of the hurt and offence they cause. And one of the innovations of this bid is not to focus on the victims of racist abuse, uh, but to focus on the perpetrators of racist abuse, um, which kind of switches things around and is not that typical um, in the UK, for example. Many modes of visual and audible racism remain hard to detect reliably, so a key part of the bid was to make sure that we went to what we call a cross-mode or multimodal, and I'll talk about that in a moment. That's another really innovative component part of this bid. The final innovation, I suppose, is the application of arts and humanities research. So we have a basic uh, data analytics model of racist language usage called ontologies. Adrian, we have a, with Adrian, we have a psychological model, which is typologies of racism. These are still quite list orientated. And then myself and Jago Morrison, who's associated with the bid, are coming to uh, suggest that there are cultural modalities of the construction of racism that are uh, much harder to detect, but that's where a lot of racism is. So that's the final part of the piece of the puzzle, if you will. Now, in my mind for a long time was if AI can read, um, re recognize faces, which is one of the most complex cognitive tasks the brain has to perform, I believe it's the most complex, then surely we could read culture with some degree of accuracy if we can read faces with some degree of accuracy. So that was my big headline. Can we read culture like a face? Why don't we? Because no one's ever really tried to do it, I think, or wanted to do it. So this project was aiming to teach AI to read complex, subtle and varied modes of online racism expressed in words, images and sound. Not the obvious, but the less obvious in a wide variety of ways. The, this is really important because it enables a much richer array of racist modes of expression to be identified and blocked, hopefully before they're shared online. It also speaks to a cultural literacy around being racist, sadly, um, which many of us um, can do almost subconsciously using images, sounds, memes and so on that have some racist element to them. And sometimes we're not even fully aware uh, that, that we're doing that, but they're there, with, if you like, within the cultural memory. If AI can read faces, then it should be able to read equally complex objects such as cultural expressions. I appreciate that <clears throat> cultural expressions are the most complex thing in the entire universe by some degree, but anyway, it could begin to go down that path, particularly around issues of race and ethnicity. So those are the, the folk I feel like. We wanted to build a tool. I've been trying to build a tool <clears throat> for years. Um, <laughs> so I'm getting closer and closer to building this tool. So uh, the tool is composed of these elements. We'll use existing racist ontologies. Ontologies are lists of words and phrases and relationships between them. I'll explain it in a bit more detail later. That already exists that you can then use to teach AI um, to do data mining, say, on Twitter and identify racist language usage. But by the, or the own admission of the ontologists, they're, they're rather limited in terms of what they can do. But they exist to train AI to harvest social media data in light of these ontologies, which to some degree has already been done. So we're just picking up on material um, uh, that has already been developed, which is fantastic. We'll direct this to psychological typologies of race. So we'll begin to consider ideas of racism that are not obvious like colorblind racism, universal racism, symbolic racism, we're all human, aren't we, racism, we're all women, aren't we, racism. So these are all different kinds of racism that are also pertinent to things like intersectionalities um, that 
um, psychological studies have already a typology of, and we want to train the ontologies to use those typologies to add the next level of sophistication. We then want to filter these typologies to what everyone calls critical race theory. Now, we don't call it that in our area, but everybody else does. So these are conceptualizations of the cultural expression of racism, not just the words, but the whole cultural mode of how racism exists in our culture, how it's expressed through language, symbolism and so on. So if you like a much deeper dig level, which is the kind of work I think that only arts and humanities scholars are probably truly qualified to do. That's the next level of complexity. So we've got three levels of complexity and the final level of complexity, and we have to really thank Abdul Sadka. I'll talk about the teams and main thing, expertise in a moment, but we're going multimodal. So already the large majority of the work done in this field, and there's some great work done in this field, is to do with text. Text is by far the easiest thing to mine and the easiest thing to identify as racist or sexist or, or good for selling shoes, whatever you're looking for. But the large, you know, increasingly most of our interactions online are visual and as we're increasingly asked to do reels and short videos and so on, there's an audio component as well. And so increasingly that becomes a new area for identifying racist modes of expression online and um, that has not been addressed as much. Um, so this is after like a fourth level of complexity. We need to triangulate, if you like, um, modalities of racism online through modes of expression and this will also we hope make uh, this one of the more accurate if not the most accurate tool for identifying and potentially blocking racism that so far exists if it was successful and if it were funded. This will be using a standard neural networks um, mode um, which again I'll talk about in a moment to create a highly sophisticated tool for the identification of expressed racism so this is not the identification of racist um, attitudes towards you as somebody in a minority group, for example, or that will be part of the, the work, but also uh, an identification of when you share a meme, then an actual fact without you realising it, that meme is racist. The aim is to flag and block all modes of racism or the large majority of modes of racism or hidden modes of racism. So dramatically improve our ability to overview um, uh, racist usage online and turn social media into a much greater cultural citizen. The team. OK, oh, I do apologise. This is not the greatest uh, visual presentation. I had to put it together on the hoof. I did think about getting photographs of the team and then I thought this is a much more uh, uh, powerful team. So this is our team and the project. Um, the first time that we submitted this project, as I said, to UKRI, I think it failed because it wasn't the right team. We tried to actually buy in, for example, data analytics expertise commercially. It's very expensive, but also it's not something that funding bodies we discovered want to do. They want us to develop our own um, apps and our own AI as part of the research project. So we focused on that and Brill was a fundamental part of putting together the right team at Brunel, which turned out to have all the right expertise in place. So the project will bring together a unique interdisciplinary team of experts. It's what I sometimes call radical interdisciplinary work, which is that you sit down with people that perhaps you don't normally talk to in the other side of campus. Perhaps you don't even necessarily want to talk to them. And that was one of the things that Brill facilitated. So in social media and AI, we're working with Abdul Sadka, who's head of Digital Futures, and he was actually supposed to just be a moderator of the process, but he loved the project so much that he joined. So that's been a really, really valuable member of the team, and he really, really has improved the um, vision of the multimodal, which had never occurred to me before. The ontology of data sets is Emma Norris, um, and again, that was just very serendipitous that she was at Braille, and that they call it ontologies, because I work in philosophy on ontology. And I said, oh, ontologies, what does that mean? And then we discovered that we had this, uh, all this stuff in common. The sociology and psychology of racism is Adrienne Milner, and she was the one who came forward with the idea of um, what we'll see in a minute is the, the knowledge gap. Oh, I might have skipped that. Actually, have that no, I think that comes up in a minute. Yep, sorry. Um, so we'll come back to that in a moment, but she was very helpful in explaining the difference, if you like, between the analysis of racism in psychology and in our area, so for post colonial studies and critical race theory. I am the critical digital literacy cultural theory person. Um, and then we have an advisor on the projects of critical race theory or post-colonial theory, as we call it, Jago Morrison. He's not on the bed because he's not allowed to be for various reasons, but he's been the advisor on this 
Um, we also plan to bring into play a panel of cultural experts so that if we want to understand um, Bangladeshi, racist Bangladeshi memes, we'll speak to experts on South Asian culture and constructions of idea of Orientalism or, or uh, um, uh, diaspora of the Bangladeshi community in the UK, that sort of thing. So we want to be really, really specific when we put together our new ontologies. The knowledge gap. Adrian really identified a knowledge gap. Um, also, this is a great thing because in our area, we don't do that. So one of the useful things about Braille is looking at how other disciplines work. I don't think in arts and humanities I've ever heard anyone really identify what we would call a knowledge gap. Adrian was quite clear that she's American in the US and other countries, particularly South Africa. If you ask people about their racist attitudes in a questionnaire, they're quite open about them. They're quite open about making racist comments about different ethnic groups. But most countries, there is a cultural taboo around that. So although they may have those attitudes, it's notoriously difficult to get those attitudes from people if you use a traditional methodology. In the UK, particularly, most of the area and the research focuses on macro level racial disparities, so institutionalized racism or individuals experiences of racial victimization. We don't want to downplay those but there is a theoretical and I suppose ethical component part of victim blaming or victim responsibility in that approach that you have to constantly go to the victims, get the victims to lead the conversation um, whereas what we want to do is really look at the wider scale cultural perpetration of racism rather than just constantly asking the victims of racism. Um, it appears that there are currently no examples of research which quantify and qualify a wide variety of forms of contemporary racist expression online. Um, so in the UK, so we're we're coming into an area where there's still a lot to do, even if we didn't have this innovative approach. What's particularly innovative about this approach is it solves this problem about asking people direct questions about their racist attitudes because you don't do that. You simply analyse what we would call their cultural production in inverted commas, freely given, freely expressed on social media, obviously not totally free, and then analyse what they're talking about and then, if you like, go back to them with that rather than do it the other way around. This will be, we think, the first such study to focus on race, how racism is perpetrated online in the UK using this tool and these approaches. It focuses on the perpetrators rather than the victims with special areas of emphasis on uh, dominant areas of racist discourse, for example, social media across multiple modes using a wide variety of approaches like critical race theory. Multimodal mining, I like it, all the M's. And here I have a meme. I don't know what this meme means, and that's why I've chosen it. Is this meme racist or not? I don't know off the top of my head. So this is the kind of problem that we're going to have as we go forward into the 21st century. My children are 14 and they communicate entirely by memes. I don't know where they get the memes from. Sometimes I look at them or I hear them and I'm a bit concerned about some of the um, uh, stereotypes that the memes perpetrate. They then also take those memes and modify them. So there are lots of issues around memes. So we'll use a multiple uh, digital modalities, including text, visual and sound. From all these modalities, we'll capture the main features of contemporary forms of racism informed by social and cultural theory. We'll combine these together into a one vector of features and run these through a neural network to create high position and AI decision making process. Uh, Has William frozen for everybody? Yeah. 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 Um. Oh, hi. Hi, Andy. Ah, oh, will you? Sorry. Will you I guess someone is going first. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll just so sorry. Now. You okay, William, to continue? Yeah, I just lost it. Right. Can you still see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right, then. So to do this, we've got a four prong process, which is the ontology development. That's developing these lists, lists that we mentioned. We're then testing the code in that standard way. And then we're continuously adapting the code to bring in experts in social, cultural, race theory. 
And then finally, continuously adapting the code by optimizing the data analytics approach using CNN, which Abdul tells me is convolutional neural network. That's his area training to optimize classification accuracy. So we're building a feedback loop, which is not unusual, but we're bringing in extra elements along the way that are unusual, hopefully to make it much more powerful. Rather than explain ontologies, which um, maybe we run out of time, I'll just move to the conclusion. So the idea of this is to teach AI to read racism online. The full title is teaching AI to read complex modes of contemporary racism using ontologies, which is just lists of words, phrases and relations informed by social and critical race theories to block racism on social media. The question was, be, can AI be taught to read complex typologies of racism online across multiple modes so as to block a wider spectrum of racist expression? from social media. And the summary of our bid is the end goal is to teach AI to see and then read multiple modes of contemporary racism with an emphasis on examining the users of racist expression themselves with the aim of blocking such forms of expression before they're widely shared and end the increasingly toxic role of racist, racist expressions online and of course more widely and the future. The focus on racism is only really to build the tool. But my vision, I'm not actually a specialist in racism, um, so it's not actually my area. My, I was interested in the wider tool, so can our tool then be repurposed for other social issues expressed through technologically mediated cultural forms? For example, sexism, ableism, ageism, homophobia, anti-vax, and so on. So that's the second level of the project. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, William. A beautiful example of the sort of incredibly interdisciplinary, I agree with William's term, radically interdisciplinary projects that can come out of the Brills. Anyone here, I'd just so encourage you to join in with uh, any Brill that comes your way in future. So let's um, just take a couple of clarifying questions, please. If you've got a deeper question, then please leave it until the end. Any quick clarifications needed? There are a couple of he here in the chat, um, but I think they are a bit more in depth, so we'll leave them till the end. Does anyone need clarification? If not, then we're going to go straight on to the next uh, presentation which is called Living Avatars in a Digital World. And the main presenter, I think, is Annie Chan. Is that right? Or is it going to be Marcus or Andra or all three of you? Uh, it's going to be all three of us. I'm going to be sharing the slides. I'll just hand over and leave it to you. Great. Let's uh, make sure all of that is working. Can everyone see the slides? All right, perfect. Uh, so hello everyone, very much um, picking up from where William left off in many respects. Um, firstly, because we found sort of a lot of the same things when we started working in Brill and particularly this um, ability to talk to people across the university and, and, and find all our uh, ideas uh, in dialogue in a way that we haven't before. Um, so today uh, you're going to hear from three of us, from uh, me, Andre Vanesco, in games, from uh, Annie Chan uh, and from uh, Marcos, uh, Marcos de Matos. Uh, and I'm going to start us off with a little bit about um, how we started and how we found the Brill project overall. So What I wanted to start with is, is, is this bit of uh, who we are, uh, how we started, and uh, essentially how we uh, found working together. So um, Living Avatars began as a, a conversation about uh, our representations of ourselves in digital spaces, in virtual spaces in various ways. And we saw this as quite broadly, sort of representations of uh, ourselves in various ways on screens, uh, in virtual worlds and in games, in um, sort of versions of ourselves that we put on uh, in social media and little boxes that you can see. Um, and of course, in a sort of future representations of, of ourselves in versions of the metaverse, which we'll get to in a minute. So 
we started with a, a, a lot of different approaches, and this is a, a lot of what we found particularly interesting in this interdisciplinary approach. We found that um, everything uh, needed to be a much longer discussion than we anticipated. We focused quite a lot on uh, terminology uh, and the different terminology and how we understand uh, ideas of, for instance, ownership very, very differently in psychology or in neuroscience versus in games design versus in law, uh, even ideas of, of objects, uh, ideas of subjects and so on and so forth. So we spent quite a lot of time talking about what we mean and how we understand these things. So um, then we uh, worked on to sort of put uh, all our work together, because one of the things that we found is that avatars have been uh, researched in quite a lot of depth in our various fields. Um, but what is missing, uh, and I'm sort of borrowing from William here a little bit, this sort of gap in the knowledge was putting all of this information together um, and sort of building an interdisciplinary framework to understand all of these ideas about avatars. Uh, and our uh, lovely uh, Delia Farris, uh, doctoral researcher, uh, helped with putting together some of these ideas and putting together a bibliography. So one of the things that we've done since is sort of um, spend quite a bit of time presenting all of these areas to each other so we have a shared uh, beginning, a shared place to start from, and a shared vocabulary. And indeed, one of the things that we um, did find uh, is actually that this uh, process and this process of working through our terminology is what, uh, in the end, focused our research. So these terms that were the terms that we were sort of um, couldn't find a common ground with became the common ground and became the focus of what we wanted to look at. So I'm sort of very, very broadly uh, describing our research areas here in uh, three categories and ideas surrounding uh, perception and behavior, how we uh, perceive ourselves in virtual worlds, how we perceive others uh, and how that um, makes its way back into the real world, how it is, uh, well, the physical world rather than the real world. I will correct myself a little bit there because I don't want to suggest that virtual worlds are not real. Um, and of course, how they are influenced by uh, real world, social, cultural and uh, other ideas and issues. Uh, and of course, how uh, representations of ourselves and representations of others uh, affect behavior and particularly affect behavior uh, in relation to sort of uh, longer exposure. So ideas of time and ideas of different spaces. Uh, at the same time, we talked about ideas of embodiment and ownership. So um, how. Uh, does an avatar stand in relation to ourselves? Uh, do we find them to be embodiments of ourselves? Do we own these avatars? Do we feel like we own these avatars from a, a, a neuroscience or a psychological perspective or from a legal perspective? How do we think of different ideas of ownership? Uh, and finally, ideas of representation of power. Uh, and I'm um, harking back to what William was saying uh, a bit again here. Ideas of intersectionality certainly play in when we look at representations of ourselves and behavior perception and all of these ideas in virtual worlds. And of course, all of these relate to much broader ideas of power and power in uh, the physical world and power in a very, very real social and legal sense. Um, so we're going to go into each of these categories a little bit. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Annie Chan uh, to talk to us a little bit about the uh, well, neuroscience and psychology aspects of this. OK, so yeah, thanks, Andrea, for uh, getting a head start. And uh, so uh, as a psychologist, uh, getting into this project, uh, we do, you know, try to contribute the kind of neuroscience research to this area. And basically, this is about perception and behavior. But specifically, we will always circle back to body ownership, space and time so that we can bring other researchers interdisciplinary expertise together. Even we have like slightly different terminology or definition, but that's the reason we have this interdisciplinary research is to you know, 
despite of these challenges, we can still come together and answer some of those important questions. And there are two important questions that we want to focus on, uh, especially using neuroscience tools. Uh, the first one is that this, this moment to moment representation of body. Uh, specifically, put it in a lay person's term, the seeing avatar act, actually activate representation of your own body. Seeing something visually similar to you, does it feel or you know, have the same mechanism in your brain. And in order to measure those, we have to manipulate uh, or quantify certain uh, 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 changes. For example, we can manipulate dist the distance between avatar and self, uh, physical distance or uh, similarity, how similar this visual representation of me is, you know, I agree with. Um, the other one is the spatial alignment between avatar and self. Uh, for example, few point, uh, uh, if you're playing games, I felt like it's easier to manipulate the body when the body is aligned with my own visual field. Uh, this is this egocentric representation versus the allocentric representation when you're looking at someone's body moving and you're trying to control it. So we can manipulate those uh, uh, um, uh, elements to answer the questions about this moment to moment representation between uh, avatar and self. Uh, the second question is about this long term representation, uh, specifically how our body representations be shaped by experience. Uh, and to go into more detail of it, it will be about the impact of training and learning. Uh, the plasticity that we can measure in the cortex, changes in perception and behavior, we can all quantify, and this neuro changes over time. There's a more loaded term uh, to represent this concept in psychology, we call that reorganization, uh, but we don't want to get into this later. But these are the two broad questions that will have specific manipulations in our experiment. If you go to the next slide, um, uh, these representation, this neuro substrate that I keep talking about. Um, uh, Andrea, do we have a, a brain in the next slide? I think she's frozen, Annie. Uh, <laughs> and she's okay. sharing this slide. Let me see oh. if I can. Am I frozen? <laughs> oh, am I frozen? So we do have representation uh, of these moment to moment kind of neuromechanism in the brain uh, in humans. Uh, for example, we have the, the dorsal pathways uh, that represent uh, body uh, spatial information. For example, there's a mark in front of you and how do you reach over to the mark and grab it? Um, these dorsal pathway are known to receive information about social perception, and that tap into our question, does seeing represent feeling? So we're going to put someone in a scanner and uh, try to measure or quantify this um, uh, 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 ownership representation and the distance between avatar and, and self um, um, in, in, in a human beings. Uh, the next pathway, uh, the next slide please, um, shows this uh, long-term representation of body uh, body uh, representation. Uh, we call this pathway the, the ventral pathway in human. It represents or is known to represent this long term uh, information about objects and bodies. And so with these two pathway, we can quantify or measure the impact from using the avatar in real life in a moment to moment kind of a uh, 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 element versus more long term experience and tapping into plasticity. Um, so we have the next person talking. Marcus, maybe you can elaborate on how your take on. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I think embodiment and ownership. Is is Andrew back? Oh, oh she's too frozen. I like Andrea or you can talk about it, I guess. <laughs> I don't think we can hear you, Andrea. Can you can you hear me now? It's cutting. Oh, no. should, should I should I go and then then you come back with, with these uh, lights? Yep. Uh, I cannot even listen her answer, oh, no. but I think I'm gonna do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. All right. 
So hello guys, good morning to you all. Very happy to be here. Um, just you know, and emphasizing the thanks that I want to share here generally to Brunel and specifically to the Brew people um, for literally putting this together. I had never experienced interdisciplinary research on this level. And I also thank my colleagues at Living Avatar for this, Andrea Annie, Wendy, Marco, Gianluca and William. Um, we, as Andrew summarized, we, we met in Brew and we had, we have been uh, challenging ourselves since then. Um, I'm going to cut to the point here. So one of the questions that uh, we have been asking that I'm going to present here for you is uh, focused on representation and power and it goes like this. Is the avatar an image? And if so, what kind of image it is? But um, I will be focusing on two more specific questions that connect back representation and power to embodiment, ownership uh, and the other issues. So. Are the avatars objects or subjects? If subjects, do they change the power relations between subject and sovereign? If objects, who owns them? Who owns them? And to answer these questions, I'm taking an iconological approach to law and jurisprudence here, um, which is to look at um, jurisdiction as jurisdiction. So jurisdiction is literally to say the law, to be the mouth of the law. It's a Roman law concept that, you know, delineates the role and the authority of the judge of a given court in announcing the law. So a, ca a case that happens in New York is under the jurisdiction of the courts in the state of New York. So it's a feature that geographically localizes the rule of law and the sovereign authorities on that issue. But which is, you know, dramatically challenged when something happens online as we know. But I'm looking at this issue using the concept of jurisdiction instead. I'm interested in how legal abstract concepts can create through fiction and can be created through fiction and turn into ideas that have pretty material social and economic consequences. And our hypothesis here is that the use of avatars can potentially impact this. Um, as you know, probably know, law and political theory are heavily dependent on fictions. You know, but the fact that they are fictions do not mean that they don't have actual, real, to use Andrew's word here, consequences, material consequences. Um, just to make myself clear, if you, you know, just an example like um, adoption and companies. What is an adoption? It's a fiction. It's an idea, a legal concept that establishes that from now on, you know, a person who is not the father of a mother of a child will be considered as if they were the father of the mother. Uh, it's a fiction that can give you a family, but also property inheritance. Um, a company, what is a company, is um, a fiction that establishes that from now on will be considered, you know, uh, in all relations, re actions related to the company, um, as if we were one person, one legal person. So this picture that I'm showing here for you uh, is the Leviathan. This is the original cover of a very influential book in political theory written by Hobbes and published in 1651. Um, and can you see the details of this picture? So if you look at the armor of the monster, you see that it's actually made of people, of small individuals. And this book, as you know, uh, proposed a notion of authority that is constituted as a power that is constituted by um, the subjects and exists now above the subject. It's not original, but it was a game changer in the time. And this is the origin of idea that a sovereign that is constituted by the subjects is able to, and it was, sorry, I just have to shift a bit here to, because of time. Anyway, the state or the social contract that was enunciated here at that time was understood as a device that we would agree on in opposition to our complete disagreement. So, um, this is the basis of what we call social contract, a protective alliance. But coming back to avatars now, uh, how do avatars change this, potentially change this iconological and fictional legal agreements? This is a question that has been in the back of my head since the, re the beginning of the project. Uh, if the avatars are part of us and can be considered subjects of law, this might change completely the justi justification of authority and the social contract between us. But let's now briefly look at the other side of the question. Are objects, are avatar objects? And if they are objects, what is our relationship to them? Let me just shift to the slide here. Um, do we own them? Do we create them or not? 
what and what I would like to propose, and we have been discussing about this, is that we do not know now what is the best legal concept or legal fiction to deal with this. Um, is the is your avatar simply a simply a property of a platform who owns it all, or do we possess the avatar while we play with it? Is the embodiment of the avatar um, in any way similar to possession? In the ancient religious, you know, meaning of someone who was possessed by a spirit, or can we adverse possess an avatar against someone else's will, as we do to property? Well, we do not currently have the questions to, you know, the answer to all those questions, but we might have, we might find it if you found this, if you found this, <laughs> and we are trying to put together uh, two different proposals for funding. But lastly, just to sum up, uh, Andrew, are you back? Um, you know, the courts have been deciding cases about this stuff and they do not have the answers to these questions, but they are trying their best to solve the social conflicts they're faced with. Sometimes, you know, clumsily attempt to apply legislation and precedent to, you know, to the cases that come. And this is just to mention a current case that we discussed um, that happened in the U.S. District Court for S Southern District of New York uh, that found out that the unlicensed reproduction of NBA players' tattoos in their video game avatars is not copyright infringement. And the courts, um, they, you know, found a way to, to use arguments that you know, no, no, nobody bought the game because of the tattoos of the players, but those uh, it was they gave like an implied license to the to the game designers to do that and qualified it as fair use. But lots of stuff are going to come out um, of this, in, you know, increased use we are making of avatars, and I'm not sure I can handle this back to Andrew now. Can I? She's not back, is she? No. Okay, so I, um, I, I'm going to close up then. <laughs> and um, I, it's been massively interesting to connect, the, you know, to develop these concepts together and try to, to make sense of the way avatars are impacting us. And um, we, we're thinking of putting two proposals um, on uh, focusing on truly different levels of the avatar um, of this avatar experiment we we are doing now and we have currently applied to become a research group which is you know open to to new joiners as well so looking forward to to hearing questions and thank you i i i, I hope we are on time thank you so much <clears throat> what a you know just as you said that last thing I was thinking oh my god they've got two projects here um so I'm so pleased that you're going to submit to uh thank uh, you so, very much sorry Mary if just to finish I forgot something very important about the, the research proposals so our we believe this research might have an impact on the metaverse which is a discussion that the government's doing right now on generating social media and specifically on human rights as well. And this is the crew that we have working on this. So thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Um, so I'm so impressed and so excited by the projects that have come out of this Brill. Does anyone have any clarifying questions? I certainly have some question, some more conceptual questions, but does anyone have any Quick clarifying questions before we move on. No? Okay, so I'm looking forward to the discussion later with this group. Thank you very much. And sorry we lost Andra. Uh, we're going to move on then to our third presentation. This one is called Extinction Implications from Microbial to Planetary. And I believe that Ronan is going to lead on this presentation, but we've also got Katerina and Shona, and I am handing over to your team. Many thanks, Meredith. Um, I will try and, and share this presentation. With any luck, it will work perfectly because these things always do. So um, thanks very much for, for holding the session. Um, I, I'm not sure I... I'm not sure I agree with this concept of radical uh, 
interdisciplinarity. Um, I, I think this is something that, that some of us have been trying to play at the edges uh, with for, for a very long time. And, and it's really nice to, to hear such enthusiasm for bringing so many disciplines and so many thoughts and methods and language together in, in all these projects. Um, this is this is no exception. Um, we we have let me bring up a few slides in terms of, of who we are and where we come from. Uh, and this this project really has brought together sort of computer science, theater, environmental science, uh, Ronan with his with his um, microbe specialisms. And, and and I think this is the, the point of Brill really has been to to mix things up a bit. And, and I find this really exciting and, and it's nice to be uh, it's nice to be joined in this space by so many people. Uh, we do need to, to thank our special advisor. We um, we fought. Well, fought is a strong word. We spoke a lot during the Brill about sort of what the what the angle for this work that we were talking about really meant. And, and Sharanya was the one who came up with with the term of extinction. So it's really her all her fault um, that we've gone down this line. Um, and so extinction is inherently a transdisciplinary term. And, and I want to make sure that, that everybody's aware that the interpretation is subjective. We often think about extinction purely as the loss of, of biophysical, uh, of bio species. Um, and, and I think we want to make sure that that thought is, is very much broadened to, to sort of the loss of culture, the loss of, so, of social aspects and a political. And, and some of this is, is positive and some of it is negative. Um, obviously, sort of the loss of biodiversity has, has multiple implications, as, as some of us may know. But, but so does the loss of culture, the loss of language and, and art forms. And, and this is something that, that really was important for us to, to bring out in this, in this project and, and as we go forward. So to sort of think about what our approach was, we all, you know, we all come up with, well, how do we how do we reframe extinction in the 21st century? And I think this is is something that a lot of the the Brill groups have been struggling with is sort of as we move into the Anthropocene as, as sort of society shifts, technology shifts so rapidly, we're left with these these terms and this language that perhaps isn't as encompassing as it needs to be. Listen to, to William talk about racism. Well, that, that still means something very different now to, to what it did before. And, and that that is evolving uh, as is extinction. Um, and so in terms of, of trying to understand both historically and where we're moving to uh, around the literature, the social, cultural, political and ecology, ecological spheres of knowledge were very important to us. Um, we then held a conference, which Katerina will talk about in just a second, um, to really try and explain some of these ideas, trying to get to, to, to unpack some of these concepts and, and looking at root causes. And as, as anyone who has been part of any of the Brills, you'll understand that, uh, that sort of the, the thinking piece just doesn't stop. We're constantly trying to figure out, well, what does our reframe look like? in light of all this new knowledge and how is that constantly moving? Uh, so yeah, that's where we are right now. So in terms of the literature, uh, and this is just sort of a, a highlight of, of the political stuff, we have over 900 references in the database right now that speak to at some sort of, of extinction parallel. And, and some of the key words that we've used uh, and that have come up within this literature, you can see on the screen there, sort of this communicative fairness, ethics of care, debt, religion, democracy, cognitive justice. These aren't sort of terms that we normally think of when we, we talk about extinction. And, and I think that's the important part of this project for us is, you know, what does irreversibility mean? Um, what what does the new the non-human world how does that it's not just a a representation of what goes wrong but who advocates for for what that will be and and how do we know what nature's interests are if we are if we're sort of trying to to connect to these ideas and and this concept this one that that really 
anchored me into this world uh, was this idea of morality, of of who we are and uh, what we what we stand for and and what we feel obligated for and 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 the future that we want to build. And I will come back to this uh, when we will present some of the frameworks that um, that hopefully well, at least we'll talk about. I'm not sure we've come to any decisions, but we'll talk about. So if I hand over now to to Katerina, she can uh, she can talk us through the uh, the conference that we held. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Yes, and thank you very much, Shona. Yes, so the following our literature review that uh, Shona briefly discussed, our second output, uh, the second output of the project uh, was an international online uh, one day conference. And this included 11 international speakers from different universities and organizations across uh, four countries. Uh, we had speakers from the UK, from Australia, from Netherlands and Brazil. The conference was made up of uh, four kinds of extinction, so four panels on social extinction, ecological, political, and cultural extinction. And in each session, speakers presented their own um, disciplinary or interdisciplinary perspectives on extinction, um, and also participated in panel discussions with the other speakers uh, and us as uh, conference organizers and project uh, members. The, we were happy that the conference had uh, 82 registered participants and attendees and many people engaged in dialogue during the Q&As and the panels. And we would like to share the highlights of two of the panels of the day. So the, in, for the social extinction panel, the panel pointed out that, well, extinction is actually not exogenous. It doesn't have an external cause of origin. And perhaps for me, at least one of the most important points made was about the current uh, relationship between the contemporary political economy and the environment. So speakers emphasize that the real risk is that political stability issues and environmental issues are not only related, but feedbacking and destabilizing one another. We question what a definition of a livable future might be, which is something that um, is <laughs> difficult perhaps to discuss <clears throat> and come up with um, with a good answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the panel pointed out that there is no such thing as a natural disaster and that societal collapse may even be beneficial at this point, uh, considering that many uh, complex societies are actually extractive. So, for example, um, um, it is important to understand that uh, there is um, a varying vulnerability in relation to uh, risk and climate change, and the vulnerability is driven by intersecting patterns of socioeconomic uh, development and ongoing causes of global inequity. So extractive policies, for example, and practices deplete countries of their own resources, but also make locals uh, financially dependent on them, making a, a turn to, env to environmentally sound practices extremely complex. So here are some highlights from the cultural panel. Um, as we know, one of the most important ways to affect change is to change the ways of thinking, which can lead to change in practices and change in policies. The panel here um, uh, highlighted that art is able to change the stories and narratives that we are told and thereby enables the project of unlearning of anthropocentrism, promoting interspecies empathy. The presenters also highlighted that cultural extinction, um, that accounts of cultural extinction are not really accounts of witnesses, but their stories passed on. And um, therefore, although they provide a coherent narrative of extinction, each occurrence is really not coherent and it covers the context of the colonial violence in which it occurs. It was therefore emphasized that embodied practices may be the solution, embodied practices that go against a Eurocentric view of the world, its exclusionary ways, uh, those embodied practices are crucial to both preventing extinction of others, of the environment, uh, of practices, and improving prospects of sustainability. It is also very important here to understand how they discuss sustainability. So uh, sustainability here is understood as a set of relations in which they care for others, for the self, for the environment, and uh, for ideas are entangled, and importantly, they are interdependent. So. I think the next slide um, is on the social media. Is that right? Yeah. I'll give it over to Rona for this one. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so I think as as outlined at the beginning, we really had um, 
uh, an international speaking panel um, with a really diverse array of opinions. And uh, we wanted then in the attendees to also uh, draw in as much uh, differing expertise and international representation as possible. And one of the strategies that we did to achieve that was to uh, launch uh, a social media campaign to advertise the actual conference and, and get attendees. Um, so with that, what we did was we um, posted relatively regularly the different uh, sessions about the conference, giving people details about who would be speaking, what they would be speaking on, giving links to more information and also the registration links. And I think very quickly we realized that there were there was quite a strong appetite for for the conference uh, and for um, I suppose what what we were going to uh, try and frame uh, throughout our session, and that I think that was reflected uh, also in the metrics associated with the social media. So, say for example, um, over the twenty eight day period leading up to the conference, we had various uh, elements that were posted, and as you can see, this got quite in in terms of impressions. We started to generate quite a few social media impressions, and then obviously we had the peak of the day of the conference itself. Um, so it was quite it was quite interesting as well because there was some engagement on social media that we could follow up on. That, um, we also during the event itself live tweeted the session so that people could see um, who who was speaking next, what they were going speaking on, and again that encouraged more uh, more engagement and and attendees to drop into sessions that were particularly relevant to them. Um, so yeah, over, over the course of 28 days, we got almost uh, 5,000 impressions. And I think what, what's nice about this is one of the legacy impacts of the Brill project is this um, uh, Twitter page, which now has a, has a network of followers that are interested in this area and potential network of future collaborators also, which is, which is quite nice. Um, so I'll pass over to uh, Shona for the for the next section where we try and frame uh, frame extinction, the easy part. Yeah, gee, thanks, Ronan. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate both of you speaking about about sort of the conference itself and and as you mentioned, Ronan, the, the sort of the legacy of of this work and and so to try and those of you who know me, everything has to be a diagram because I'm I'm just built that way. So trying to, to think about some of the, the literature, some of the conversations that were had during the conference, trying to draw out some of these ideas. Um, there are obviously these feedback loops uh, that, that sort of tie to, to what is sort of traditionally known as ecosystem services around food security and water security, but also around health and, and livelihoods. And, and constantly these are these frameworks uh, and feedback loops are amplified by inequity and inequalities. So this is something that that I think when we're talking about reframing extinction, just looking at the, the ecological system doesn't tell the story that um, that exists between these feedback loops. And I think that's something that we really want to, to start to examine much more. Um, We've also thought about sort of this idea of, of impact scenarios. I mean, it's very obvious to, to sort of understand some of the, the biophysical ecosystem service negative impacts on food webs, on planetary boundaries. Many of you may have read different reports on the loss of biodiversity and, and the impacts that that has. Um, it's, it's also quite easy to think about sort of the, the negative human system services, if we like, this idea of, of geopolitical conflict being driven by different elements of extinction, the loss of language, the loss of culture, the obliteration of culture in some ways, um, and sort of the movement of as, as climate change impacts different situations, people are going to have to migrate more. So what does that do in terms of, of sort of the extinction of, of social identity? Um, it's much harder to, to think about sort of positive uh, human services uh, in, in this idea of is, is social extinction actually a good thing? Will it create space for transformation in a way that we haven't seen before? Will it allow social and political innovation to happen um, in, in sort of much more radical and, and rapid ways than, than perhaps we've seen over, over time? And time was one of these things that, that kept coming up in our conference and our discussions. 
when we have people talking about sort of dinosaurs and, and geological time, and then we talk about social time, it's it's really hard to, to reconcile these kind of ideas in the same frame. So we don't we don't pretend in any way, shape or form to have any of the answers. I'm not sure I can think of positive ecosystem services yet, but we're still trying. Um, but one thing that that perhaps maybe I did wonder, and and some of the biophysical scientists, some of the natural scientists in the type of model, this idea of drivers and pressures and states, and and perhaps maybe there is a way of, of being able to use existing frames like this that that, that are more uh, easily accessible to different members of different groups in terms of scientific disciplines or in terms of thought processes to actually run some of the extinction uh, mechanisms or, or loss of different types of extinction events through these sorts of models to see what we might end up with at the end and to see whether eventually we can end up with a management response to either exacerbate a positive extinction or reduce a negative extinction. So these are some of the ideas that we are we're constantly sort of fighting with uh, within our own minds and within the group. Um, and this has sort of led us to the idea of, well, where do we go from here? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we know. I'm not sure we've made any rash decisions yet. Um, but there is definitely sort of an article that we need to write that's based on the literature review. If we have 900 uh, different types of articles, then we really need to think about what that looks like in terms of, of publications. We, we've talked about this idea of a, of a commentary article that really starts to look at the frames of extinction. There is a new journal that's being launched by Cambridge Prisms called Extinction uh, that seems to be quite a nice fit, uh, but also making sure if possible we could do a simultaneous publication in a more arts and humanities minded journal that would allow that audience to to continue to be connected and, and continue to to feed on each other um, in, in sort of a knowledge generating system. Uh, and we've also thought about this idea of a, an edited volume um, with the conference speakers. Uh, and this has sort of led us perhaps maybe away from a big grant right now, but looking more at sort of the network grant. And Ronan, you, you mentioned this idea of the legacy and of the network that we have, um, not just within the speakers, but also within the audience. And I think that there is definitely an appetite for, for sort of how do we take this discussion further? How do we think about the frames that, that we are thinking about in a much more comprehensive way? So I think that would be sort of our first stop in terms of, of grant work. Um, and then lead, what would come out of that network grant may well be the much bigger um, grant proposal in the end. Um, we've also thought about perhaps maybe just blatantly stealing the avatars group of, of becoming a, a research group. Um, that's, that's possibly an idea if we could generate uh, interest within Brunel around this idea. Um, and and collaborations and with with speakers uh, going forward in lots of different ways, and I think the the really important piece that Brill has allowed us to do is is to just continue to think about this. And the more we think, the more, in theory, the more knowledge we generate, or at least the more questions we generate, um, and therefore the more possibilities of of explorations and 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 opportunities we can come up with around extinction as a much more holistic term than it's been before. Um, so this is the picture that was produced um, on a report that was published the day after our conference by one of our conference attendees, James Witts from Bristol, talking about the dinosaurs, because everybody should talk about dinosaurs because they're just fun. Um, but um, if, if anybody wants any of the details in terms of the project itself, it, there are still on the, uh, it's still on the web, that link is still active. So. I would uh, encourage you all to to go to that page and, and just have a read of, of where we are and, and sort of some of the thoughts that we've put together at this stage. But thank you very much. Let me uh, see if I can stop sharing this. 
Wow, beautiful work. Thank you to this group. Um, incredibly deep and conceptual and I totally support your idea of trying for an AHRC network grant first. That makes complete sense. Uh, I have one quick um, clarifying question. Which database was it that you were mentioning, Shona, early on in the presentation? You just said the database. Oh, sorry. This was a database that was uh, was generated by our research assistants. We had two research assistants, one looking primarily at, at ecological and, and sort of life sciences, and one looking at cultural, social and, and political sciences. Oh, perfect. Uh, so it's a homemade database. Absolutely, it is. It's a gold mine is what, is what it is. Yep, wonderful. Any other clarifying questions before we move on to the next group? No, I'm not seeing any hands. I'm okay. All right, in that case then, thank you so much. And let's move on to our penultimate uh, presentation. This is going to be led by Dr. Emily Hunt. And it it's a project that explores uh, representations and definitions of body body image, not body language, although of course that might be included. Over to you, Emily. Perfect, thank you. Um, can you see my screen all right, first of all? <laughs> yep, we, we can yeah. see fine, yep. Perfect, so yeah, uh, firstly I wanna say thank you to everybody that's presented already. It's been really, interesting from my perspective just listening to all of the presentations and how far they've how far the projects have come since we initially presented our proposals um back right at the end of the um the brill um labs so yeah i've been really enjoying them so far so um as Meredith said, our um, project was looking at the portrayal and definitions of body image um, among adolescents in particular with non-visible disabilities on Instagram. Um, as I'll go into, um, the focus has shifted slightly from Instagram, um, but this was something that um, we hope will come out a little bit more um, as we develop the project further. So um, I think I have a few of the members of the team, research team with me today, Wendy, Jean-Luca and Keming, I think are within this group. I think Charlotte's on annual leave, but hopefully if I can't answer any questions, um, the other members of the research team might be able to. So the focus of today, I'm going to talk you through sort of our overview and our project aims to give you a bit of a background about what the project is about. Um, I'm going to talk through some of the challenges and opportunities of working as an interdisciplinary team. Um, probably will cover a lot of what other people have covered in terms of working as an interdisciplinary team, but I want to make this unique to what our team um, has brought together. And then finally, I'll talk about some of the public engagement um, that we're hoping to do and what the future prospects are for this project. Um, so to start with, um, I think it's best to just define sort of what body image is and Essentially, this was a conversation we had quite early on, especially coming from an interdisciplinary team. We wanted to make sure that we were on the same page, or at least we have those debates and discussions about what we might define as body image. Um, so we can explain this as the, the individual feelings, the emotions, the thoughts, um, and also the perceptions of of our bodies. Um, and when we look at the literature, we know that um, body image focuses on the, um, the physical appearance, um, but it also looks at the functional aspects of what our body does as well. Um, so when we look at the body image literature, we, we can see that this has um, a concerning negative impact on children and adolescents and for their general overall well-being. So around 92% of teenagers um, go online daily um, and because of this and the links with social media and the negative um, impact on body image, this is obviously a big concern. So this was an audience that we wanted to um, address um, in particular because of how much they're sort of in, social media is ingrained within their worlds. 
We also know that disabled bodies are a lot less frequently shown in the mainstream media as well as social media. So disabled bodies was a topic that we wanted to um, wanted to draw on and we wanted to see actually, you know, what we can find in terms of the research evidence. I mentioned here non-visible disabilities and again this was a definition that we had to discuss and debate within the interdisciplinary team um, and this is something that's often quite overlooked um, particularly because it's very hard to research so when we identify non-visible disabilities we're talking about and this can be referred to as invisible, hidden, less visible disabilities, but essentially they are typically defined um, as impairments that restrict daily functioning, but they're not always readily observable by other people. So, for instance, they are other people can't easily identify that somebody might have a disability. So this can be things such as um, certain cancers, it can be things like learning disabilities, etc. So there is a wide range of types of disabilities that might come under this non-visible non disabilities sort of umbrella. So we know that disabled bodies are less frequently shown in the media and obviously this is more so for non-visible disabilities because of the um, because of the nature of non-visible disabilities, it's very hard to identify. So with knowing this, what we wanted to do and the aims of the project when we first started is we wanted to firstly explore how body image was portrayed on social media and we wanted to understand the definitions of body image for adolescents. So we had a sort of two part aim for this project. Um, and the programme of research that we proposed and that we're currently carrying out is that we first wanted to do a literature review, so we wanted to understand the literature in a bit more depth. And we had a wonderful doctoral researcher, Chris Bell, that worked on this for us. Um, so as a research assistant, um, he explored the literature, which I'll go into in a bit. The second part of the research program was then a co-design um, workshops with young adults. And again, I'll go into this shortly. So what we wanted to achieve out the literature review is, to, like I said, to understand what the definitions of body image were for non-disabilities, but see what research was already out there. So Chris did a wonderful job at compiling a lot of both quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods research. And I wanted to just talk through a few of the main findings from this. I won't go into loads of detail about all the different types of studies, but these are sort of some general findings that um, that came out of that. So firstly, we identified or Chris identified that um, there were very few papers that actually examined the relationship between all three of these elements. So body image, um, disabilities and social media. So although there might be research on, say, body image and disabilities or disabilities and social media, combining the three together, there were very few papers. So this is a gap in the research that we've sort of identified. There was also um, a general finding that social media can provide positive opportunities for those with disabilities. And I think this is really important to mention because I've been talking about the negative impact of social media and potentially the negative impact of body image, but actually social media can provide a really positive space. And I think this is something that as a research team, we're really um, conscious to try and um, provide in the future and something that we want to look towards is to actually provide more of a positive space for people with disabilities. And the last thing I wanted to mention was that although disability research has focused on how um, people with disabilities are represented in the media, this is often to do with the Paralympics or elite athletes. So the representation of athletes, for instance, after the Paralympic Games. Um, so of course, this is a bit skewed towards a different type of um, audience and potentially doesn't reflect um, just seeing the, the average person um, being represented on social media. So from this literature review, we know there is a need, we know there is a gap in the research evidence, and we know there is a potential positive impact going forward. Um, so the next step is what we're trying to do at the moment is to 
do some co-design workshops with young adults. So the purpose of these co-design workshops was to essentially get the, um, sorry, I have go on one more. The importance of these was to actually help us to find um, to find these young people and help to understand from their lived experience um, what they know about disability, body image and social media. Um, although we can speculate that potentially Instagram is a big social media platform, potentially there are other platforms that we don't know about that actually are being used more regularly. Um, they might have more insight into terms of what are some of those core issues in society as well. And essentially, we want to understand what they think about this type of research. Where do they think it goes? So a real core element of this project and something we wanted to embed from the start was this idea of co-design and hopefully that will inform the future projects. So where we are at the moment with this, um, We've had our ethics approved and we did re begin recruiting, but we found we got a very, very limited response. So we were essentially reaching out via Twitter. Um, and although we were aware it might be quite a hard to reach population, and this was a risk with going forward with this study, um, we didn't sort of anticipate the limited response we got. So we went back to the drawing board and we've reevaluated our strategy. And so we're just sort of pending the amendments at the moment in terms of where to go next. Um, we have planned these co-design workshops to take place in June. So hopefully within the next month, we'll have some um, strong sort of output from these co-design workshops and they will then lead into our future prospects and what we want to do in the future. So that's a really speedy overview of the project and the project aims. And now I want to talk a little bit about how this has come together as an interdisciplinary group. Um, so as you can see on the screen, we've come from a variety of departments and divisions within um, within Brunel. Um, we have health sciences, statistics, sport health and exercise sciences and games design. And although potentially these don't always seem like they overlap, there is a small level of overlap between all of us that I think we've found a common ground with this topic. Um, so, for instance, Dr Wendy Martin, um, she has um, done some research with visual analysis and digital methods, but also has expertise in body and embodiment as well as well-being. So this overlaps with some of the work, for instance, with Charlotte Kerner, who has worked on body image research and working with young people and mixed methods design. Um, and then on the other end of the scale, we've got Keming, who does um, statistical analysis and sentiment data analysis, which hopefully we're going to bring in at a slightly later stage in order to analyse some of the data from social media platforms. And then myself and jean Luca have a bit of an overlap with digital storytelling and some narrative techniques um, and some qualitative data as well. So we come from very different backgrounds and I think this is a strength with our team. So something I wanted to highlight was the opportunities this brought and actually something that we found quite early on is that when we're looking at this topic, we're looking at it through very different lenses. So we're looking at it um, from obviously our own um, research backgrounds, but also our own personal experiences as well will will inform what we think about these topics. So although we have very alternative um, approaches. We do think they, that these have actually been really complementary. So a lot of the debates that we've had in our meetings, we've tried to have regular meetings since the end of the, the Brill um, labs. They've led us towards coming up with more of a, a complementary and collective approach. Um, Another opportunity that we found is that we're able to connect different types of data. So I mentioned about qualitative, quantitative methods, and it's really interesting to see actually that um, some of the um, data that's come out from the literature review that Chris has done, um, we're able to now connect because of our expertise, some of that quantitative and qualitative stuff that potentially wouldn't have been connected before if we just um, been an individual person or you know from one discipline. We also um, 
think that this is a really excellent opportunity in terms of the Leatherhome Trust. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've had a few difficulties with recruitment and this shows the risk of this project in terms of um, it is a difficult, hard to reach population that we need to just take sort of a leap of faith with to try and actually understand this, pro this topic in more detail. Obviously, there have been challenges and I think um, as myself as an early career researcher, working with people with a vast amount and a much more experience than myself, it's been really interesting to see the different methodological approaches and research philosophies that people bring to the table. And like I said, it's although it was a challenge in terms of terminology at first, we were sort of tripping over ourselves a little bit at first trying to figure out, OK, how do we def define disability as a group? Um, but actually, this has helped us to come to a more um, well-rounded definition and something that um, rather than being very um, narrow minded about, we've been able to um, bring together different expertise. So where does this leave us now and, and what are we doing in the future with this? So I wanted to highlight the public engagement um, aspect of this project. Um, I mentioned around the co-design workshops with young people with non-visible disabilities. So obviously we are trying to um, include the young people within our research process and Obviously, as of yet, we don't have any results from this, but I think it's really important, especially when researching something that isn't visible. Um, we can all have our own assumptions and perceptions, but essentially it's really important to speak to the people that it involves and involve them in the process. Um, so hopefully through these co-design workshops, we can build a network with these young people and that might potentially lead to further public engagement in the future. We also um, engaged with a health and social care committee inquiry. inquiry. So um, we'd, com we'd partially completed the literature re review at this point. So this was in January. Um, so we submitted evidence towards this. So this was the government sort of health and social care committee inquiry um, around body image. Um, and um, we included information around disability and social media to include in that. So what does this all mean? What does this mean for the future? Um, we think this could be really impactful for policy. Um, we know in terms of organisations, in terms of meta and, you know, the various different um, online um, forums that people can use for social media, that there are issues with um, with these platforms. So I think impacting potential policy in terms of how people um, are presented or how people can present themselves and be perceived on social media is really important. Um, and hopefully it will, this type of project will increase awareness as well. So not just for us as researchers, but for potentially for the people that we're trying to um, improve their um, well-being and essentially make their lives better. Um, we hope in this project as well, there's an element of knowledge translation and we have um, the expertise of Gianluca in terms of how to present um, work quite visually. Um, so hopefully this knowledge translation and increasing awareness will help to challenge some of those norms that we see as well. So our future plans are firstly, we have this um, this literature base that Chris has put together for us for this literature review. So essentially we want to develop a peer review publication from this literature review, um, but also combine this with what we find from the co-design workshops as well. Um, so we realise that the literature review is um, is a very isolated understanding of the of body image, disability and social media but actually helping inform that with the co-design workshops, hopefully we can um, develop a publication that tries to um, tries to merge um, applied practice, um, real world examples with the research evidence. We're also looking to um, create an interdisciplinary research proposal with these three areas. Um, this is at really early stages, if not like very, um, sort of pre-contemplation at the moment, but essentially um, we're still looking to um, develop a Leatherhome Trust proposal, but obviously this will be really informed by the co-design workshop. So we're very reliant on the information from that, um, 
but we're feeling really positive about how that can actually bring us forward and the how that can Im, um, influence the the proposal that we put forward. Um, so I think I will leave it there. I'm not sure if I've come to the end of my time, but of course, if you have any questions, I think the other members of my team are with me as well. So thank you. Great work. Thank you so much, Emily and the team. Um, it's really, really nice to see this uh, project moving forward at such a um, productive and sensible uh, pace. So yeah, really, really well done. Uh, any clarifying questions to begin with? Um, okay. Akram agrees that with your co-creation of questions, it's definitely one of the more powerful aspects of your methodologies. Um, so if I don't see any hands up, I'm not seeing any clarifying questions in the chat. So let's move on to our final discussion, final presentation, and then we're going to have a very uh, exciting and interesting discussion between all of the panelists and and people uh, attending. So on to our final uh, presentation. I believe it's going to be led by Harjit Singh, and it's got a bit of a strange title, but it will be absolutely explained. True value of a unit of energy in the developing world. Over to you, Harjit. Thank you very much, Meredith. Hope uh, people can see my presentation. Uh, so let me just go to the presentation mode. Right. Uh, the the idea was funded by thankfully by the brain, 21st century body's brain. Uh, what we were wanting to discuss was or identify was what was the true value of a unit of energy in the developing world, especially the uh, the renewable energy. And why we uh, the purpose of this presentation is then to introduce to the people why this question came up and what we have achieved towards uh, answering the question, if at all. The partners with me in crime were Professor Nigar Hashim Zadeh, she is from finance, and uh, Dr. Pin Lin Lau, who is from law uh, faculty. N now, I'm going to give you the background of why the question was asked and then uh, what we did about it. Uh, I'm sure people are aware, but still I would like to do it for my satisfaction that in our, in my view, relevant to the projects that we have done so far, there are four reasons why that we're talking about renewable energy, especially for developing world. The first and foremost being that the, there is a huge demand supply gap, in cre which is increasing on the back of infrastructure development happening in this, these parts of the world. Uh, population increasing, urbanization and industrialization. Uh, for example, India is developing 100 smart cities. The cooling demand of the buildings uh, will increase sixfold by 2040, which will mean that uh, electricity has to be either met through the renewables or through the existing fossil fuel based energy power plants. Uh, the, although there is a huge program on the renew, for the renewable supply as well, but the coal will remain and that's the biggest worry. So, so the environmental hazards will remain there. Then uh, the, there is another issue in the developing world, which is they have they're really lagging into facilities for treating the municipal solid waste, which is produced in millions of tons. For example, India is producing 55 million tons of year, 10 million tons of it per year, and 90 percent of it is uh, actually dumped in the open sites, which causes contaminants, uh, contamination to the air, water and soil, uh, causing health issues and so, so, and for, so forth. Then the issue of food and nutrition is a big problem, especially where its predictions are that the world will be 9.3 billion uh, in 2050. And if you to meet the, the demand of food for and nutrition for people uh, in 2050, then the crop has to production has to be doubled. So it has to increase by up to about 100 percent. Uh, already in 2020, one third of the world population did not have access to adequate food. 3.6 billion adults and so millions of children suffered malnutrition. This is when we are also wasting one third of the food because uh, because of the lack of facilities, especially in the developing world. Where, and these lack of facilities are cold chain facilities, which are which require to run huge amount of energy. 
then finally, even if someone has energy, we've seen in the last about six months that the cost of energy has rocketed. So what we've done actually in background is to, to resolve these challenges is this that uh, we, we've been developing uh, solar energy generation and storage systems and also some advanced installation systems which were funded on various projects by uh, funders listed here, which includes the UKRI, Newton Fund, British Council, etc., etc., GCRF. Uh, these were all projects in collaboration with uh, Professor Savastasu and Maria Kalkathroni and Jan Wissing. Uh, I, as a PIU or as a co, I have attracted funding up to about 25 million or maybe more than that, where the projects have been run and are currently running in 10 countries in four continents, all looking into developing solar energy technologies and insulation. Uh, some of them are pretty interesting. We developed very focused technologies for India, Kenya, Tanzania, etc. Then also we've been developing vacuum insulation for cold chain equipment. We have a good fund, amount of funding in that as well, uh, including from industries about a million dollars now. Then we have also developed using this vacuum insulation a vaccine storage device, which was funded by Bill and Benita Gates Foundation. Uh, so these just just some, some examples of what we've been doing. For example, we developed a municipal solid-based valorization uh, system for India, uh, where the system is run entirely by solar energy and produces biogas as well as the biofertilizer from the municipal solid waste, which is otherwise a problem, as you can see mountains of it just outside Delhi here, a photograph which I took myself. Then uh, we've also developed a cold storage uh, for Indian uh, poor farmers, where uh, which is actually causing uh, currently the lack of them causes huge amount of stress, economic stress to these farmers, up to whose 70 to 90 percent of the income depends on uh, the local whatever produce they produce, which is, and these farmers are very small farmers. We're looking at about two acres per household uh, property in this case. Uh, and to meet the demand of the food short shortage, as well as to, to sustain the economic sustenance of these families, India requires huge amount of cold storage capacity and if it's installed then the trouble will be from where the energy will come to run these systems so so the, we, we developed a system which is purely solar energy run as shown here it's installed in a place uh, about 200 kilometers away from delhi uh, then we also developed cold storage for uh, on two, in two projects one for kenya another for uh, tanzania and india uh, it, and the, in this case, there are uh, up to in Kenya alone, there are about 1.3 million beneficiaries if the system is uh, replicated a, in sufficient quantity as the demand is in, in that country. The system is again entirely run by 100% solar thermal energy. Then uh, this is the site of the uh, of the system that uh, is that was at that time when we visited was being planned to be installed. Then also we installed a system in Kenya which which developed a 100% solar dryer for uh, drying the pine seeds the, the for, for forest trees. Uh, the the problem with the pine seed cones is this that the uh, they on one hand Kenya wants to uh, in, wants to plant actually 2 billion seedlings by 2023, but they had no capacity to produce enough seeds to do that. So the only way they did, the, currently they're producing seeds is by these rudimentary methods, whereby the pine cones are uh, dried in sun and it takes up to six to nine weeks to dry one pine cone. But we produce a system which could then uh, which could then dry these pine cones without needing any external source of energy within two to three weeks. So saving up to four weeks, uh, up to six weeks of time of saving, as well as producing the pine cones of better quality. The 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 impact of the system could be that the, up to about 180,000 employees in the field could be employed, kept employed, as well as the environmental benefits could be drawn from uh, producing these pine cone seeds. Then we also produce a system to 100% dry tea in tea factories using solar energy. These tea factories, there are 70 of them in Kenya, 67 in Kenya and three in Tanzania, owned by 
an entity called Kenya Tea Development Agency, KTDA. This KTDA uh, organization is a cooperative organization owned by 560,000 farmers. Each one of them are very, very small farmers who's up to 90% of whose income depends on the income or income coming from tea, selling tea. So, and also, uh, so, so, the, so this system could have economic impact as well as it could produce huge amount of, it could save huge amount of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, in this case, 930,000 uh, of tons per, per year by displacing the wood, which is currently used to produce heat to dry, see, uh, dry, uh, to dry tea by the solar energy. So, I have, and then also we, we were there last week uh, in, in Egypt where we, we were uh, looking at a system we developed for a remote whole health care center, which is 100% driven by uh, photovoltaic, solar photovoltaics, as well as and the combination of it, along with a solar thermal run organic and kind cycle shown here. So uh, the idea is to run the health center in a remote area 24 hours a day. Uh, so without access to any any uh, without access to any grid power at all, so with with huge impact onto the local communities who have no access to power otherwise. So so wh where are we now? We 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 understood that uh, in our group that we have a we have developed technologies who could contribute to the sustainable development around the world. Uh, and to list you some of the sustainable development goals uh, are listed here are two, three, seven, twelve, thirteen. But the, the problem that we faced, because what we are actually in our group are all engineers. So we did really understand what how, how what the true impact of our technology could be and uh, how could it be evaluated and communicated. And that's where this project idea came up. So I collaborated with Nigar and Pins to understand uh, to understand and benefit from their talents and knowledge level to produce something uh, which will allow us then to evaluate this impact using tangible as well as intangible factors such as electric power and thermal energy, which is understood by us, but we couldn't understand how to calculate the impact of employment, life quality, economics, uh, clear, uh, cleaner environment, policies and wellness uh, of our technologies and how to put that together in one number. Uh, so what we did actually that we, we, we sat together, we also developed a we, we actually organized a workshop at Brunel, which which brought in uh, six uh, speakers from abroad into uh, from outside Brunel, uh, two of them from abroad, actually one from a professor of development, uh, engineering development in IIT Delhi in India and one industrialist from Kenya. Then we also had uh, speakers from Durham University and an economist from Durham University. We we brought a practitioner from a large company, Federated Hermes International, to speak on the development economics uh, and how do they account for it and how do they look at it from the industrial perspective. As well as we brought a colleague from Oxford University, uh, a, a senior lecturer in law. Then uh, we collected huge amount of views of the experts as well as the attendees, uh, which led us to then at some stage uh, submit a proposal. Actually, we submitted a proposal for funding to the Warm Clean, Warm Clean Growth Alliance grants run by British Council in collaboration with the partners in Israel and Kenya to uh, to uh, to, uh, to see if we can develop a computer model that will be able to uh, evaluate for us the impact of technologies or the value of energy we generate. Uh, and then our ultimate aim is to uh, hopefully this will this uh, proposal will be successful. We're still awaiting the results of it. Uh, but our ultimate aim is to try develop a larger UKRI proposal uh, or under a GCRF or any other similar poll uh, to to uh, to really see uh, to develop a methodology that will allow us to evaluate this impact as well as uh, allow us to uh, transform our uh, our impact in in a more tangible manner. I think that was it. I wanted to say thank you very much for your attention. I'm not sure how much time I've taken. Thanks. Any questions, please. Thank you so much, Harjit. What an excellent project. Thank you, and to, and to the whole team. Okay, so 
If there are any clarifying questions for Harjit, we'll take them now, and otherwise we'll go on to any questions at all for any of the uh, presentation teams. So feel free to put your, please do put your um, cameras on. Um, we'll deep in Harjit. I'm not sure how to do that. Oh, we've done that already. So please put your cameras on. Uh, hands up for questions or type your question in the chat. Teams, of course, might have questions for each other. Um, <coughs> Maybe I'll just get started with a sort of a comment, sort of a comment, but also a question for the Living Avatars team, um, and maybe especially for Marcus. I'm wondering about the history of the notion of owning our bodies, because of course, you know, I'm a big Hilary Mantel fan, and her second book uh, in the in the uh, Cromwell trilogy is called Bring Up the Bodies. And that refers to the fact that um, people who had been condemned to execution uh, in, the 15th, in the 15th and 16th centuries were dead the minute that happened. So what the executioner meant by bring up the bodies was walk the people up who were still alive, but they're just bodies now. And that was really because their bodies belonged to the state, in particular to the regent, to the sovereign regent. So are we going to see a, a change, do you think, maybe, in terms of uh, owning our avatars in a similar way that we now own our bodies in ways that we didn't once? Um, should I take it now? Yep. Oh, I don't see any other hands yeah, up. Yeah, <laughs> OK. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I would say that the avatar does have the potential to change what do believe our bodies to be. If if that is, uh, I think that that, that would be my approach to to the, to the question. Um, I, I I do. Um, I mean, I I don't know that work, but I do know that the discussion about um, if you are uh, the whole discussion about biopolitics goes even further than that. Like I think it's Giorgio Agamben who, who has a claim that um, in Roman, in, in ancient Rome, uh, people could be sacrificed without being killed. So he, he has a study called Homo Sacre, uh, where he, he elaborates on, um, a, 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 it's a kind of death penalty, kind of worse than death, very creative <laughs> a punishment, which was um, someone committed a horrible crime. So the, the Roman assembly would gather and they would vote that person a Homo Sacre. This Homo Sacre was a sacred person. That meant that that person doesn't belong to this world anymore. He, he or she has been sacrificed. So what rests is only the body and we can do whatever we want with that body and it's not going to be a crime because that person doesn't exist anymore so that was a horrible punishment and um so uh, i believe th the avatar does have a potential to change how we understand what our bodies are connecting back to what you said um well, the, the idea that we own our body is quite recent in, in modern, you know, modern times. Like only the people who were people were able to own their own bodies. Um, most people until the Enlightenment revolutions, they were they were not fully people in the sense that we, we, we mean today being a person. You could you could be a servant, you could be a slave, uh, you could own other people's bodies in a very legal and political way. And um, I think studying the avatar, uh, we can we can connect to that to that scholar that kind of scholarship and and try to 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 elaborate on on what do we believe our bodies to be now? What are the limits and and who owns our bodies? Because if the avatar is part of us, someone else owns it, <laughs> which is kind of very problematic in a way. I think Marco wants to add to that. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. I think that's a great question, but one unique way that our team can address that question is by linking um, uh, these, this political aspect of what is a subject, what is an object, 
and neuroscience and biology in general, because what Annie presented is one way to measure whether you were in charge of your avatar, that is an object, or whether in fact the avatar was a subject acting on its own and not having an impact on your brain. If there is a disconnect between your avatar and your brain, then it's not you and you are not legally liable uh, of what the avatar does in the metaverse. That is bold, but that's, you know, uh, in a nutshell, what, what we could do, I think. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, some comment or question from Andra? Sandra, you're muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, just wanted to add a bit because this is a perfect question to sort of show how our different disciplines uh, interact here. And um, one of the questions that uh, has been asked thoroughly in video games is um, why all uh, all genders prefer to play a female avatar in a variety of games. And the answers to that illustrate various different attitudes towards ownership and towards whether we see the avatar as subject and object in a completely different sense of those terms, in that there is an exploration of, uh, of identity. There is an exploration of trans identity and of femininity on the part of male identifying players. But there is also a, a, an underlying sense of misogyny for many who say, I would rather control the body of a woman and see the body of a woman as on screen and play with her in very possessive ways. So that also plays into some of those ideas. It's frightening stuff. Right, please, questions, comments, uh, compliments, um, complaints. Hands up and join in. Nothing is forbidden. Marco. Most of the presentations and the presenters have said, I don't believe in multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. But in fact, you don't have to believe. Sometimes um, it does bring people together um, around a table, helps your own discipline. And so it's fine if some of the teams, like us perhaps, we think of two different projects, uh, go their own way. But that exercise has helped um, each individual. So this is important. Yeah, I agree. Shona, you mentioned that you disagreed with William's term radical interdisciplinarity. Would you like to expand a little on that? Yes, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not disagreeing in, in with with interdisciplinarity or, or transdisciplinarity or, or any definition that that we might want to use. Um, what I what I do disagree with with this idea that, that this is a new concept that that we must all embrace immediately. I think there are some people who have been trying to to work across and between disciplines for a long time. I think there are a lot of people who who recognize, as, as you just said, Marco, the importance of of having this discourse between people. But that's not to to sort of uh, slate the, the importance of that very sound and very needed disciplinary thought process. But it's 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 that sort of bridge uh, effect that, that we can have as scholars who are willing to, to reach across different elements of the university and different pathways and think in unique and, and, and broader terms in more holistic ways. So it wasn't a let's not do it. It's this is this has been going on um, and let's there, there are some people who have the skill sets and we are building those skill sets. And, and let's continue to have those conversations. Yeah, thank you, Shona. Um, certainly uh, several people did come to the first Brill uh, feeling very, very apprehensive about interdisciplinarity. And most of them, I think, you know, really, really learned a lot, got very much out of their comfort zones. And, and that's been very productive. But transdisciplinary, study and interdisciplinary research don't replace disciplinary research 
um, and and pe people can be comfortable with both or just one, and uh, certainly not about replacing or superseding or anything. So, Harjit. Uh, yes, I just wanted to contribute to this interdisciplinarity discussion. I, I have my own, always I have my doubts on whether interdisciplinary really uh, contributions really help, especially in the projects, the kind of projects that we've done so far. Uh, and so far I must admit that we had very little, very few people from outside engineering and sciences contributing to our projects. But we have now come to a stage, especially with the this Brill idea that we were funded for, that we feel ourselves constrained, restrained in terms of capacity or capabilities in really evaluating what we set to evaluate for us, this true impact of energy. And we really need people from different disciplines, especially economics, law, policy, etc., to work in our, at least on this project. But yeah, so, so at this stage, I, I will, uh, for at least for this project, I agree that I need uh, people from other disciplines to work with us. And we've already had uh, Nigar and uh, Pains with us. But but then uh, in some areas, of course, I would say probably interdisciplinarity may not really be very helpful. So it has to be specific to the project we're dealing with. It can't be an umbrella for everything. Hmm. Well, there's a call for anyone in the room who uh, wants to talk to Harjit about joining his projects. Um, Hajit, you and I should speak too, especially about the policy aspects. Yes, please, very much. So I'm very happy to uh, to collaborate with anyone involved. Yes. So questions or comments, Marco. Hello, uh, and thank you very much for all these interventions today. I really very much enjoyed them. I just wanted to say that to me, how stimulating multidisciplinarity is really I think it's absolutely great to have chances to hear about work that takes place within a non-constrained space from that perspective and be able to contribute to it um, and most of my background is inter has been interdisciplinary and I've gotten used to experiencing sometimes field ostracism from all sides uh, and protectiveness from those sides so it's great that Brill creates that space. I absolutely agree with Shona that interdisciplinarity has been a thing for a long time and that it thrives off specialty within those disciplines. Um, I think I also, I agree with Willem though that we, we, we've needed to make it into a radical thing again, uh, in a way. That's probably what he meant with that, I, I, I suppose. Uh, so I want to thank everyone. It's great to hear about so many projects that bring different expertise together in that space so thanks a lot yeah and i should say that marco uh, is developing a project based on our second brill that you'll all probably hear about at the next research festival that second brill was based around the concepts and notions of food systems okay i believe we have katarina and then marcus you're on Katerina, that's a no. Old hand. OK, Marcus. You're on mute. So I just want to add that I think um, interdisciplinarity has to be a value at some point because um, kind of an ethics on its own, because, you know, knowledge is disciplinar in a sense that it needs a discipline to be produced but also it restricts you it, it's it's a, it is a relation of power so <laughs> power coming back here so it's like i I'm, I'm comfortable with the knowledge that is in my area of discipline but at some point when i'm confronted or put in or, or i'm in touch with with the discipline that is not mine i'm completely overwhelmed or lost so, uh, but is that not knowledge or is that not disciplinary as well? So of course it is, but how, how do we, then how do we actually produce knowledge that is free from this, these boundaries of disciplines, you know? Uh, is it possible to produce knowledge on, on, on the top of that or under it or, or, or away from this, um, from the discipline and power that, um, that is imposed on us by 
the university institution, you know, institutional knowledge since school. So I, I think that there's something when we talk about radical interdisciplinarity, I think there's something that in there that has to be recognized as an ethics because it influences the way we teach as well. Like, are we only able to teach the stuff that we are comfortable with or is, is, is science and, and knowledge actually available <laughs> outside of my field that I should connect with or learn from, you know? Yeah. Shona and then Marco, unless that's a legacy hand, Marco. One thing I, I just wanted to, to mention, and we, we all speak it, just because of the boundaries that, that we happen to be in, we speak very much from a Western centric perspective on knowledge and how we transfer knowledge and how we think about knowledge. And I just want to, to bring up this point, this idea of sort of cognitive justice and knowledge equity, uh, equitable knowledge transfer, and, and really bringing up sort of the experiences and the knowledge sets of the global south and partners that we work in in different spaces to to that same level that we understand sort of our own scientific uh, foundational knowledge um, and and that must be and and has to be more uh, encouraged more to be very much on that same level playing field around knowledge and how we think about knowledge. Uh, that's something that that sort of I I wanted to to make very clear within sort of this interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary discussion that it's not just a, a Western centric perspective that we need to maintain. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Shona, and thank you for um, saying that. We need to continually say it and try very hard not to forget it at any point. Um, Katerina. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to potentially add that um, uh, that sometimes we uh, we use interdisciplinarity, but actually we're just borrowing a framework and call it interdisciplinary. Um, so I think it's it's also important to fully use disciplines in, instead of just calling something interdisciplinary, um, because there's mainly because there's a lot to miss out on. Um, when we don't fully engage with the different disciplines that make a project interdisciplinary. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. A valuable point. But I, I do think you can have small overlaps between disciplines. And of course, interdisciplinary does not mean learning another discipline. It means working with people from that discipline. Annie, go ahead. Just a, a quick comment. I think um you know, before I started this, you know, attending uh, the brew section, you know, some of us thought that, okay, we need to think of something that we agree on and make a decision and move forward. But then I think at the end of the section, with all these meetings, I felt like we don't have to do anything that we always agree on. That's the whole point. Like we have different things. And the question, you know, no one talk about it because we never think that we can just do our kind of like research with the questions that we don't know yet. Like th that's the whole point of getting a grant is we don't know. Let's just do it. And 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 I think I'm happy to to actually share thoughts uh, with my colleagues. And and I felt like it's like this is a very, you know, a nice safe place for us to disagree on things. Exactly. And any. I think that's a beautiful point for us to finish on actually that we're not agreeing to disagree but we're agreeing that disagreement is a wonderful thing for research yeah um so we finished exactly on time thank you so much to all our wonderful speakers thank you for the the speakers for all attending the first brill and making it such a success uh people who haven't yet been part of any brills please um Watch out for them. Uh, there is one on hydrogen coming up very, very soon. If you if you're interested, we might have just one place left, maybe. Uh, so send an urgent email if you're interested in attending the next Brill. And um, thank you very much for all the excellent questions <coughs> and discussion. And uh, I'll see you at the next research festival event uh, this afternoon.